Michael Greger, thank you for being here on this vegan plant-based summit. It's good to meet you at last. I am happy to be here. So I doubt very much whether there's many people out there that have, have never heard of you. So, but for those one or two people that haven't, tell us where your plant-based journey started. Oh, my, uh, well, it actually all started going back all the way to my childhood when uh, my grandmother was uh, diagnosed with end-stage heart disease and sent home in a wheelchair to die, basically. The, uh, there's nothing more the doctors could do. She had so many open heart surgeries, basically run out of plumbing at some point, get so scarred up inside, confined in a wheelchair, crushing chest pain. Her life was over at age 65. Wow. But then she heard about this guy, Nathan Pritikin, one of our early lifestyle medicine pioneers. And what happened next is actually detailed in Pritikin's biography. It talks about Frances Greger, my grandmother. Um, uh, though she was given her medical death sentence at age 65, thanks to a healthy diet, she was able to enjoy another 31 years on this planet till age 96 to continue to enjoy her six grandkids, including me. That's why I went into medicine. That's why I practice lifestyle medicine why i started the the website nutritionfacts.org and why i wrote the book how not to die why all the proceeds from all my books are all donated to charity i just want to do for everyone's family what pritikin did for my family that's absolutely amazing now i know that a lot of lifestyle diseases such as coronary heart disease non-alcoholic um, fatty liver disease, COPD, diabetes, obesity, all caused through diet-related lifestyles. What's your approach to that? What's your take on it? Well, um, since these are lifestyle diseases, we need to treat the cause by changing our lifestyle. Certainly there are drugs and procedures that can slow down the rate at which our uh, um, at the, the disease overtakes us. But if we actually want to stop the disease, reverse the disease, we need to treat the cause. Um, and so for lifestyle diseases, we need to you know, stop smoking for COPD, increase our uh, fruit and vegetable intake. Um, for uh, heart disease, uh, what Pritikin and Ornish shows, you can actually reverse the progression um, with a healthy plant-based diet. Um, uh, same thing with type two diabetes, same thing with high blood pressure, same thing with fatty liver disease, same thing with obesity. So the same, it's quite remarkable. The same diet can reverse the course of so many different diseases, um, including heart disease, the number one killer in the UK and the USA. Yeah. And that's up there with, um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which kills over 70 million people in the U S I believe each year. Oh, the, and the, the, uh, the, it's the leading cause of liver transplantation, now leading cause of liver failure, and it's because of the obesity epidemic. Um, a very high percentage of those who are overweight and obese have fed liver, whether they've been diagnosed or not, which can become inflamed, lead to what's called uh, uh, a NASH, which is an a, a inflammatory syndrome of liver, which can lead to cirrhosis, scarring, liver cancer, um, and require a liver transplant. And so, yeah, it's really quite serious and uh, people don't take it, um, uh, this, this non-alcoholic fatty liver syndrome is not, uh, is, is uh, really underappreciated as a cause of uh, morbidity and mortality. Now, people seem to think that the quick fix is the best fix and that's obviously a tablet. But there's something that we can actually do to prevent further illnesses um, from taking hold of us and actually cure or get rid of or reverse or slow down the ones that we have. And that's a plant based diet, isn't it? And it's not a vegan diet necessarily, but a plant based diet. Correct. It's a diet centered around whole plant foods 
where we're minimizing our intake of meat, eggs, dairy, and processed junk and maximizing our intake of fruits and vegetables and whole grains and legumes, which are beans, split peas, chickpeas, and lentils, nuts and seeds, herbs and spices, mushrooms, basically real food that grows out of the ground. These are our healthiest choices. Now, I'm, I'm a health coach and I quite frequently get people saying to me, I've got diverticulitis, I can't possibly eat grains. Where do I go with that? Yeah, you say that's totally understandable because that's what we used to be taught in medicine, um, that diverticulosis was caused by eating popcorn or nuts and seeds or something. Um, but it turns out when it was actually put to the test, the opposite is true. People that um, eat uh, uh, more of these whole healthy plant foods actually have less diverticulosis. It is a disease of fiber deficiency, just like scurvy, it is a disease of vitamin C deficiency. Diverticulosis, these outpouchings in your colon are a result of a fiber deficiency. So we need to increase our fiber intake. The two most concentrated sources of fiber are whole grains and beans. So the other one I get, well, I get two more, but the first one is um, I can't eat legumes and pulses because they make me bloat and they make me really ill. What would, as a doctor, would you say to people that give that excuse as their reason to not go plant-based? Oh, well, um, I, I, you need to have the, the right microbiome to be able to handle the legumes. There's these indigestible sugars in legumes that... Uh, uh, that can cause uh, bloating and gas and, and abdominal discomfort in people. Um, and it's just a matter of going slow and so that your microbiome adapts to these healthy foods. If you've been you know, slathering your insides with cheeseburgers and milkshakes your whole lives, your microbiome is, uh, may not be able to handle all these prebiotics um, like the resistant starch and fiber and whole healthy plant foods. And so you have to go slow. Now, most people that don't have to worry about it, uh, most people don't actually suffer any kind of abdominal discomfort. But for those that do, um, studies show it goes away in about two weeks um, as your microbiome adapts. And so you just start slow um, uh, and uh, keep increasing until you can get to my recommendation of three servings a day of legumes, ideally. And the other one I get all the time is soya. You're not allowed to eat soya, especially if you're female. Do you agree or disagree? Yeah, well, I mean, um, uh, the, uh, that comes out of a misunderstanding. Uh, so soya has the so-called phytoestrogens. And so, uh, and, uh, and women think, oh, estrogens uh, may increase risk of breast cancer because we take estrogen blocking drugs like tamoxifen for breast cancer. So we wouldn't want to eat phytoestrogens. Um, but that's, uh, it's an oversimplification. There's actually two types of estrogen receptors in your body, alpha and beta, um, uh, and uh, your own in inherent estrogens uh, preferentially uh, attached to alpha and the soya, phytoestrogens attached to beta. So whether or not it has proestrogenic or anti-estrogenic -anti effects depends on the relative ratio of alpha to beta receptors in the various tissues in the body. And so soya does have a proestrogenic effect when it comes to building one's skeleton to, in terms of improving bone health. Um, so inc increasing bone density over dairy milk, for example, that's a, a proestrogenic effect. Also um, stops menopausal hot flash symptoms. That's a proestrogenic effect. But in other tissues like the breast, it actually has an anti-estrogenic effect. Um, reducing one's risk of breast cancer. Um, and so it's what's called the selective estrogen receptor modulator. It says um, uh, it's kind of the best of both worlds in terms of um, the estrogen effects where we want it and the anti-estrogenic effects where we want it as well. Um, and so women that eat a lot of soy have between 30 to 50% lower risk of developing breast cancer in the first place, also have better survival. If they do get breast cancer, those that eat soy versus not, um, and, uh, and uh, lower risk of, uh, of re relapse, so the risk of the cancer coming back. Um, and so, uh, you don't have to eat soy, but uh, it's certainly one of the many healthy legumes to include in your diet. It seems like every week um, a new diet arrives on the market and one more wackier and fattier than the previous one. Um, 
what do we actually eat? What are we supposed to eat? What, what's right? What's wrong? I mean, it's the keto diet one week. It's the low carb diet the next week. It's the, the Japanese tonic diet the week after. And everybody is on social media saying, this is the one, look at my before and after. Um, what are you going to say to people that do the before and after and the testimonies and they believe them? Uh, I mean, with so much nutritional noise and nonsense these days, I wanted there to finally be an evidence-based diet book. And to that end, uh, that's why I wrote my book, How Not to Diet. I cite thousands of studies, uh, digging up every possible tip, trick, tweak technique proven to accelerate the loss of body fat, um, to give people every possible advantage and basically build the optimal weight loss solution from the ground up. Uh, spoiler alert, it's a diet centered around whole plant food. So the healthiest diet is also the best diet for losing weight. Um, uh, but uh, to check out the science, I encourage people to, uh, to check out the book. I have how not to diet and I have how not to die and I have the cookbook too. And one of the problems I face when I'm trying to convert people to a plant-based diet is it's too expensive, it, there's too many ingredients, and it's boring. So when I show them your book, they're like, oh, okay. Um, how did you get those recipes all together on a simple um, platform where it's anybody can do it from any culture? Oh, yeah, isn't that wonderful? Yeah, I'm, I'm so happy with it. So I have two cookbooks now, the How Not to Die cookbook, the How Not to Diet cookbook. Um, all the recipes were done by Robin Robertson, who's this amazing creator. Um, uh, I just basically sit down with her and we go through, you know, these are the kind of recipes I want. And she's the one that, uh, that, uh, that uh, it gets down to the nitty gritty. Um, and so, and they've been such positive, there've been such positive responses. I'm always thinking, well, the next cookbook, I'll try working with some other people, but no, it's just, they all work so well. And so I think I will stick with her. And so my next book, How Not to Age, will be out in December 2022. And that'll be followed by a How Not to Age cookbook, which will be out December 2023. Why do we have to wait that long for it? Well, I've got to do all the work. I got to. Do <laughs> I think How Not to Diet had 6,000 citations. This one is looking like it'll be 8,000. It's a huge amount of work. It's just an enormous body of evidence in the longevity research. And so I want to dig through it all. So your tagline is, I do the research so you don't have to. So if people buy your book, and this is not a plug, but if they buy your book, they can they can rest assured that the information in that book is right and they don't have to look very much further apart to the cookbooks for evidence. It's the, it's the best reflection of the best available balance of evidence at the time it's published. Of course, that's the problem is that, uh, I mean, that's why I like online uh, uh, education better because, you know, if something changes, I could just change it. Whereas the book is already in print sitting in a library somewhere. And so if I screw something up or get something wrong, it's just going to sit there forever. Um, but uh, yeah, so, but as of printing, or actually not even as of printing, as of writing, which is months before it actually even comes out in print, um, uh, you know, it was, uh, it, it's the best out there. Um, and we have, have a whole team of fact checkers to, to do our best to make sure that we've uh, got everything right. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, eventually I'll have to do second editions of all of them because there's so much great new science out there. Well, you could always just go straight to audiobooks. Oh, yeah. And then, yeah, I've been doing all my, all the audiobooks myself. I've been, that's, uh, it's something I dread every time just because it's such, so hard on my vocal cords, but uh, it's good to have them out there. There's one thing I want to ask you. Um, a lot of coaches now are focusing on metabolic diets. And some pe people are pushing them as this is the way to go. It will stop you aging. It will have instant weight loss. You'll be more energetic. And others are like, no, you'll just get weight loss from that. What's your perspective? You mean diets that like boost one's resting metabolic rate? I mean, the only one that's been shown to do that is a plant-based diet. You, for some reason, it may have something to do with fiber intake or maybe polyunsaturated fat intake, but you put people on a plant-based diet and all of a sudden you get a boost in resting energy expenditure, meaning you lose more weight just sleeping, lying around, just your basal metabolism is higher. 
um, by an average of about 8%, I believe. Um, and so, I mean, if you want a metabolic boost, you eat some plants. And what about if you want a protein boost? What do you do then? Uh, if you want, pro well, anyone who doesn't know how to get protein on a plant-based diet doesn't know beans, right? Legumes. <laughs> Beans, split peas, chickpeas, lentils, those are the plant protein superstars. Also, there's protein in the whole grains and nuts, seeds, and other things. Um, we're just looking for 0.8 grams per healthy kilogram of body weight. That's all the protein you need. And that's simple to do on a healthy, varied plant based diet. Those, for those people who haven't got your book, How Not to Diet, in the book, you say what you should eat, when you should eat it, and how you should eat it. Have you got a little tip from there that I can share with the people so that they, you know, they can learn. Oh, above and beyond just eating healthily, I have these so-called 21 tweaks um, of how you can accelerate the loss of body fat beyond. Um, and so this is things like uh, preload with so-called negative calorie foods. Uh, negative calorie preloading just means starting out a meal with uh, you know uh, fruits, vegetables, soup, salad, or simply a tall glass of water. Basically, anything with less than 100 calories per cup. So, for example, eating a large apple before a meal is so filling that people go on to eat about 300 calories less food. So, 100 calories in, 300 calories out. Eating an apple before a meal effectively has negative 200 calories. Um, I also uh, recommend people stop eating after seven when the sun goes down, I recommend two teaspoons of vinegar with every meal, um, a quarter teaspoon of uh, garlic powder once a day, on and on. So there's 21 of those uh, that uh, all from various different angles um, either act as appetite suppressants or fat blockers or starch blockers, or whatever, um, in addition to just eating healthy. Um, but if you just want to get to your end goal a little quicker. One of your um, talks, which is on nutritionfacts.org, um, talks about why people put weight back on when they've been on a diet. And it, it's, a, it's, it's, it's very weird. People think that they're still in calorie deficit, but they're not. So Isn't that remarkable? That is such fascinating work. Yeah, so the, re the primary reason why people plateau um, is that they're no longer actually restricting calories as much as they used to. Um, and you can get away with that initially, um, but, uh, but I mean, that's, that's, that's why people stop losing. They say, wait a second, I'm still on the same diet I'm on before, but if you actually measure what they're eating, they're not on the same diet they were on before. Um, and that if they were actually in that same calorie deficit, they would continue to lose. Um, until you know they uh, they matched their uh, their energy requirements of their lighter bodies, and basic metabolic rate is really important there, isn't it? Because you need to set your calorie intake at your me basic metabolic rate if you want to lose weight, and you're exercising as well. Um, well, ideally, yeah. No, we would want to. I mean, but the way we do that is not by counting calories or, or restricting portion sizes. The way we do that is by eating healthy foods, right? That just have, uh, so looking at, uh, you know, calorie density, for example. Um, instead of counting calories, I mean, there are some foods that are so low in calorie density, meaning so few calories per volume or per weight, you literally couldn't, you'd have to eat wheelbarrows full, even to maintain your weight. It's just impossible to overeat certain foods. And so the more of those foods you have in your life, then there's just effortless weight loss. You feel full. In fact, you couldn't eat any more if you wanted to, um, but you're continuing to lose weight just because so few calories um, uh, per unit. So that's mostly fruits and vegetables and um, I have, uh, you know, calorie density charts in the book. Finally, my last one you'll be pleased to know is what's your take on superfoods as a supplement for people who are transitioning or people who are, still have a processed food diet and they want to be healthy, but it's going to take baby steps for them to get there? Well, I'd rather the baby steps they do is actually eating healthier. You know, if there were just three things you could add to your diet. The three first things would be berries, the healthiest fruits, greens, the healthiest vegetables, and legumes, any of the legumes. So eating, you know, lentil soup or hummus or something. Um, and then the, there were just three things to first take out of your diet is be anything with trans fats, 
processed meat, bacon, ham, hot dogs, lunch meat, because it causes cancer. And third would be uh, liquid candy, soda, sugar sweetened beverages. So if you just did those three things and just added those three things, you would be a long way on the way towards eating healthier. Brilliant, thank you. Dr. Gregor, it's been absolutely amazing talking to you today. And thankfully I've actually got hold of you at last because I've been, I've been badgering your calendar for such a while. Um, Mary's been brilliant and I oh, just great. thank you very much for meeting with me today and taking part in this vegan plant-based summit. So glad I could help keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you.